So my name is Joe Ayers. I've been a ham since 1974 when I was first licensed as a kid uh, uh, with a novice license. Uh, I've been in uh, product development for most of my career with uh, hardware software products. Uh, so I uh, live and breathe in development environments uh, nowadays. I am one of the uh, main contributors for the firmware for the Arden software. So at the birds of the feather, if you have any questions in more detail on the firmware or any of the open source and embedded Linux that's in there, I can go into uh, some detail on that if anyone's interested as well. So hang around for the, the three o'clock birds of a feather. Uh, that's an open discussion that we can, can go into more whatever detail we want to talk about at that time too. So in, uh, today in this presentation, the uh, been a, a big, big discussion in, in some of our community of what's happening with allocations. These are very, very valuable allocations with, uh, that we have and have been using uh, for a number of years. So let's let's you know before we dive into that we need to just do a brief review of what are the allocations we have and and we'll cover some of the basics of those allocations and then go into the specific of what the proposals are at the FCC and and uh, what's on the table and and uh, then we'll we'll speculate a little bit about well what what might that mean for us and and go in and then go into some of the the hardware issues about how we can continue to adapt uh, commercially available hardware to continue to build high-speed data networks. So in the three, five gig, even two gig in the microwave range, our allocations for ham radio are considered secondary. Now what, what does secondary mean? Uh, it means we're not going to cause any harm to the primary. It uh, means that we can't claim protection from interference from the primary. But, and most importantly for, for us, is other secondary or other uh, licensees in the space have to accept harmful interference from us. So that'll, uh, that, that rule is uh, important for us and we'll, we'll touch base on where that, that uh, you know, who we're competing with and who we have to be concerned about and who has to be concerned about us. So, sec so that's secondary, it's, you know, it's primary, secondary, and then additional secondary or other licensed rules uh, after that point in time for allocations. So the, the significant one for us is the unlicensed space where we overlap with, with Wi-Fi in everyone's home. Uh, that's, that's part 15 are the FC rules about that. And so they're considered, they're considered after our secondary or additional licensing in these frequency spaces. So, so when we're working at a tower site or working uh, wherever, Part 15 device manufacturers have to consider that they will have to accept interference from radio stations, broadcast, amateur, who are you know primary or secondary uh, allocations, depending on on what frequency space we're talking about. But of course, in in two gig and five gig, uh, we are secondary. Part 15 does have to accept interference from amateur radio secondary licensing. So let's look at the actual allocation as it sets today. This is right off of the FCC's frequency allocation table. You can tell the primary allocation is capital letters. So radio location, and this is, we're looking at the three gig space for the ham radio allocations from 3.3 gig to 3.5 gig. Radio alloca uh, location, well what is, what is that? What is the primary? Well that's military radar basically, which is predominantly gonna be used on coastal areas, you know, San Diego offshore here and we'll have it. Uh, those, that's the primary and we're uh, not able to cause interference to that primary. I don't think anyone that I've 
uh, know about has ever had any situation here in prime area of military of any interference uh, that I've ever heard of. Has, has any of you heard of any of that in Southern California? It's, uh, uh, this would be a prime area we would have it, but the, the significance is, is we don't today have to be too concerned about transmitting in a three gigahertz band. Uh, we don't really see competition with the primary. Uh, it's, it's wide open, it's, it's clear for us. So where's, where's the secondary? Well, it's uh, non-federal use uh, is amateur, that's us. And, and of course, more of radio location uh, for, uh, uh, in, in non-federal use of, of the same as well. Uh, so you can see over here, here's the follow-on allocations for, uh, you know, beyond the secondary part. Uh, there's no part 15 here. There's no unlicensed in this space today. And we don't see any uh, real competition with any land mobile uh, part 90 type devices. So we don't, we don't see that. Three gigahertz for uh, using for Arden is a wide open space for us today. So let's look at five gig. Same thing, radio, radio location. Uh, there's uh, Doppler radar in here. Now, so we're looking at, uh, I'll show a frequency table so we can kind of map it up to channels here in a minute. Uh, we're looking at 5650, 5830, uh, uh, all the way up to 5925 through the amateur allocations. So, so this is the, the five gigahertz area of concern for the amateur allocations. So, so here's where we are competing up with part 15 devices that have to accept interference from us. Here is, uh, in this higher area, is uh, some fixed satellite, mobile, uh, primary, and, and then amateur. We're not, uh, you know, we're not really seeing any competition today with any of these. Uh, ISM equipment, we're not competing with those. You know, could be a microwave type toaster device, they're not telecommunication devices. Uh, or land mobile or some of the personal radios. We're not seeing any competition with those, those today. So let's look at it, take a step back and kind of map that up to all the channels and, and where we're at today. So this is the unlicensed space. If you, you go into a home access point, you'll, you'll see some of the, these lower channels down here. Uh, the Uni 1, 2, and 3, uh, that's Unlicensed National Infrastructure is what that stands for. And these are different, pa you know, the different allocations for different power requirements and purposes for use of unlicensed. So uh, we can see up here in the 5 gigahertz range where the HAM allocation is, uh, we're going from overlapping with the unlicensed starting around channel 132. Now these are center frequencies. You'd, you would actually have to be above that so that you didn't have emissions below the, the band edge. Uh, but that goes all the way up to the band edge of channel center 185. Now originally there was a, a an unlicensed 15.247, that was before 802.11 protocols came out. It was for, as they were starting up with spread spectrum technologies and, and was allocated. And then eventually that became a, a, a Uni 3. Now that allocation is typically used by wireless ISPs. Probably in a lot of access points, you're not gonna see channels up in that area as as selections, they're they're going to be alloc you know they're going to be 2C or or one or 2A uh, al allocations that you might see in a typical home access point. But you go to a tower site with a wireless ISP, you're going to see channels going all the way up nowadays to 169 with a 10 megahertz bandwidth that stays within that that frequency allocation. I just ran into that two weeks ago installing some equipment down in San Juan Capistrano. The city has up a brand new ubiquity device and it was running 169 at 10 megahertz for sure, right, right at the edge of that unlicensed allocation. So we start to see those um, 
there was a 25 megahertz slot at the top of this that only was converted to unlicensed about four years ago. It, uh, Uni3 uh, uh, fell short of that mark by about 25 megahertz until about four years ago. And, and so a lot of devices out there, the Air Max series used by Arden, the Aero and OS, and those were designed before that time, so they only go up to like 165 at, at the top. So you may run into Air OS and other devices that only go to 165. It's because they didn't expand it all the way to, uh, up to channel 170 until about three or four years ago. So three gig, Here's our allocation here from 3 up to 3.5. And in the Arden devices, the support is from about 3,370 up to 3.5. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more. I'll blow up on that, and we'll talk about why that is the case uh, here in another slide in a little bit. But we, you know, we noticed that if you took a 5 gig, subtracted 2 gigahertz, then you get into this range here that there's, there's some uh, very easy uh, two gig um, uh, trans, uh, transducers to get down to that frequency range. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. So what, what does this proposed rulemaking say? For the three gig, it basically says, let's clear the band. Reallocate amateur radio to some unspecified location. Interesting. Seek comments on what that location might be. Maybe it's 3.1 to 3.3. And then prepare it for future use. Really interesting NPR. They're, they're, they're trying to, uh, an NP, you know, notice for proposed rulemaking, they're, they're, they're clearing it and they're not actually saying what they're going to do with it yet. Interesting. So we'll, we'll, we'll get, let me get to that. Let's talk about the, the, the uh, so let's talk about the 5 gig NPR. What does it say? It, it doesn't say anything about ham radio in our secondary allocation, right? It, it's not proposing to change that. We still have rights and, sh and we're still sharing it. So the space of concern, and let me, let me float back up to the bigger screen. What we're talking about is this space right here from 5.85 to 5.925, channel 170 to 185. That's where we have clear sailing today to use to build networks in you know, highly densely populated Southern California and other areas like that. That's the, that's the space this proposed rulemaking is talking about for five gigahertz. And today, it actually has an assignment. It has a primary assignment for transportation usage. They have, have it all fully defined uh, with, with these channels going up through you know, 184 up to the band edge and to be used for uh, you know, intelligent transportation systems, uh, safety systems for cars. This is uh, uh, cars making ad hoc communications with other cars, with bridges, with with other safety issues within the transportation structure, with uh, you know navigation, with all kinds of features that is now building this network at you know across the cars, and and it was all it's it's already been assigned and we've been uh, coexisting uh, with them, but unfortunately, well for us they they or good for us they haven't used it, right? It's been clear for us. But unfortunately, because they haven't used it, the FCC is going to take it away. That's what they're doing. So if we look at it, in that uh, allocation of 75 megahertz, they're saying, all right, we're going to give 45 megahertz of that to the unlicensed space for unlicensed use, 802.11 protocols. 
and we're going to keep 30 mega, megahertz. That's they've they've had 75. Now you can have 30 megahertz. But let's get comments. Are we going to have it with the manufacturers that want to do 5G protocols, or? And we're going to share it with other manufacturers that want to do 802.11 protocols. Or should we just do all 5G protocols on, on that whole space allocation? So, so the, the different manufacturers of cars are in two camps right now with, with two different protocols. Is it the cell protocol we're going to use, or is it the Wi-Fi type protocols that we're going to use? And, and so they're... Uh, uh, basically lost allocation because they haven't used it for many years today, which was good for us. So to extend the unlicensed spectrum, what does that do, right? So this, they, they used to call this, they were going to call that the Uni4 for, for what it was. Uh, unlicensed, but it's really now this is being extended to uni, you know, uni three licensing, which is the uh, rules and power requirements that WISP operators would use at tower sites. And we can see here that now they can have a 160 megahertz channel. Now there's enough bandwidth to add one more 160 megahertz channel. Now that channel is only provided with the latest 802.11 AC modes. You can have a 160 megahertz channel with, with 802.11 AC, not with N. And so it, it fits nicely, and that's one of the reasons why they want to take it up to 5895 is to have more of those those 160 megahertz channels that would typically be used in your home. Uh, a wireless ISP is not going to use 160 megahertz bandwidth because the power limitation won't allow them to go very far at all spreading the energy across the 160 megahertz. Tower sites are going to be using less than 20 megahertz typically. If you look at AeroS and Ubiquity, you'll find that the, band, the channel width selections, they go at a lot of different intervals, you know, seven and a half or 10 megahertz or uh, 12 and a half, you know, down in that range for their channel options. So there'll be a, a specific channel width that is optimal for the long, di long, the distance that you happen to be going, just the way the timing and everything works, um, that, that channel width, there will be one that's that's optimal for a particular distance. So so this is what the proposal is saying when it extends the unlicensed up, and then it it leaves the uh, 30 megahertz on the end for the transportation groups. All right. Well, so what does that mean to us? Let's. Uh, Let's speculate here a little bit. Now, now some of the information that I have here, I've, I've learned and has come from uh, in a conference call I had with the lawyer that's representing the ARRL uh, and wrote the comments representing the HAM community to the FCC. And he was a career FCC uh, employee uh, that, that knows the environment quite well. So, so one of the things he, he was telling us is that with this election cycle, there's a big push to complete rulemaking if there's going to be a change of leadership of the FCC. We want to complete rules, get them in the cycle uh, to, to have that badge of, of what got completed in, in a tenure. So it's going to go quickly is, is what the indication is. Uh, if and uh, wanted to happen by, by the end of this year to, to turn it into a rule. Uh, the, you know, today we do not have primary allocations. We can't expect that we would get a primary allocation for amateur radio. And that, that feeds in because the commercial momentum is massive, right? This is, 
the, the, the need for the space, the commercial devices, and, and everything everywhere from your toaster to, to your car uh, wants frequency space to do this. <laughs> well, I, I might, might have my, my toast, you know, I might want to have my toast, you know, pop up in the morning and me alerted it's ready, right? <laughs> so, you know, we, we really should expect to share frequency. We've been sharing it, something we've done for uh, all, all along, so we should expect that we're going to be sharing frequency. Um, now, 5 gigahertz was already used for transportation. That's good. They're, you know, they're not at tower sites. Uh, they're going to be down at road levels. They're going to have a little bit you know, lower power requirements. But we're not going to be competing with them at, at our tower sites or cell coverage sites. And uh, it, it's only down at the you know, street level that, that we're going to have some, some lower noise in power that, than what we'll be using. So the question was, well, when a car or an intelligent vehicle needs tower access, will that interfere with this? Well, they already have established you know, cell data networks that are not in these frequency allocations that they would be using for that purpose. So even today, with what is it, OnStars, you know, some, of the, some of the services that the car companies provide, they're all through cell, cell data. So we're not competing with those, so we'd be, we should be okay in that regard. This, this is, you know, uh, vehicle safety and, and vehicles communicating to one another. There, in some of the rules that I've read, there's, there's even limits on how high off the road an antenna can be, uh, lower power requirements of, of what they're doing. So uh, it's, we haven't seen any competition or uh, issues of interference to date, but of course there hasn't been a lot of, per, you know, it's not pervasive out there yet, so. I was going to comment on that the, if the cars need tower sites, it's probably easier for them to piggy box uh, off of cellular networks rather than yeah. building an entire national infrastructure yeah. for it. Yeah. So also with 5G type stuff, uh, hey, we're going to use... Yeah, it's, there's an existing infrastructure for them to, to do that. Uh, get into servers and other, you know, smart applications. Uh, they don't need to rebuild that with this frequency space, and we're not competing with it. So, it, it, so it's good they're not at tower sites. Uh, five gigahertz going to licensed for uh, Part 15 or Wi-Fi, you know, it is bad. They are at tower sites, and, and uh, we know today that if you're at a commercial tower site for you to lock in that you're going to use a particular frequency, uh, you will have to pay a premium price competitive with what a commercial vendor m may be paying. Uh, I'm, I'm at a major tower site. Uh, I'm, I don't pay premium pricing if, if a c commercial uh, entity came in and said, I wanted that space on the tower, I would have to move unless I'm willing to pay the same rates as, as a commercial uh, entity is. Um, so uh, it is, it is going to be challenging at, at tower sites to uh, be competitive to, to use this, uh, any of the overlap frequencies. So, but the other, on the other hand, sharing the space means that there's going to be a lot of devices out there that can be at low cost that we can repurpose and, and use uh, for, for our needs as well and customize capability and functionality as we're doing today. Now, the FCC, when we looked at the three gigahertz proposed for rulemaking, they were just looking to clear it. They, they didn't think that anybody was using it. They didn't know. Uh, in fact, uh, what, what we learned is, is that in, you know, years ago, for years and years and years, hams worked for the FCC, were, were part of the process and rulemaking process, and had knowledge that could feed into it to do that. 
Today, there are no hams in the process working at the FCC. Well, we, we could speculate. Uh, uh, it, it may just be because if you look at the typical, you know, what, what's the average age of a ham radio operator today? We're retired, right? So we're, you know, we're in the age of the internet and our challenge and what Arden is, you know, doing is, you know, marrying internet age technology and, and interest with, with ham radio. So uh, this is a kind of technology that we're bringing more in, but we need to do more and, and then some of those individuals will go in and work for the FCC maybe, maybe one day. So, so they, the FCC didn't know that anybody was using it. They thought they'd just clear it and make it ready. So all of the comments, maybe some of you have posted comments uh, to, to this, they're learning. We've had a lot of cities post comments that, that they're using it. And, and if you read through those, you, you can go to the FCC website and read through everyone's comments. And if you look at the ARL's response, basically they're saying the, the rulemaking gave no reason why amateur radio um, needed to be relocation, relocated. We share today as secondary. We should continue to share all of this frequency allocation in moving forward. And, and so that's, you know, that's, that's what we, we want. We, we don't want our allocation to change. And so there's a reasonable chance that it won't change because now the FCC is aware that we are using it. Uh, the jury's out. We'll, we'll still have to wait for, uh, for the next steps to see what happens. But we, we, can ha you know, we should have uh, you know, a positive outlook that they will keep it uh, as we are in the 5 gig. There's no reason or any other argument that says we shouldn't keep it in the 3 gig just the same. We do, yeah, so the question is, are there other emergency agencies that are um, uh, commenting on this? I've not seen any comments from those kind of agencies, uh, you know, a Red Cross or, or even like the Orange County Sheriff or, you know, fire. Today what they're using is a commercial solution from Verizon or AT&T that gives them a quality of service in the infrastructure for uh, these kinds of situations, you know, for an, an incident or disaster scenario. So they're, they're buying, and I, I saw the Orange County Sheriff, they, they rolled it out. Um, it's, it's a little, you know, cell data, with, you know, looks like an access point with antennas on it, and it gives them a data source through the cell tower that has quality of service. Uh, it was some, it's something new that they had, Three years ago, they tried to get data service through, through Verizon at a community event, and the community event was so saturated they couldn't get data service as just any other user of it. Now they can, and so those entities are all going to these types of commercial uh, applications that are generally 5G based in, in cell data networks. Um, or they're doing satellite like, um, uh, the Red Cross will bring out their, their satellite uplink and they've got some uh, ability to get data back to their, uh, their uh, data centers. So, so the question is, is you know, what are commercial entities doing? Like, you know, Cisco was an example, or you know, other commercial entities for for their disaster communication plans. And so, uh, you know, all all the commercial entities uh, are 
are are using all of the commercial data of enters for communication plans. So, you know, they're going to go to Ver Verizon or a satellite, you know, company that provides those services. We know Elon Musk is launching satellites, you know, 60 at a time to provide broadband services of some of which some of that will be emergency. So, so all the commercial entities are going to go to the same source. All of the commercial vendors providing those data services, whether they're satellite or cell data, gener generally. Right. Right. In, in, Cisco, in Cisco's cases, uh, you know, you'll be creating the equipment that augments providing the data to the different agencies, right? So, uh, where where when you look at Arden or Ham Radio, you're you're likely not to see a city or a Red Cross or a hospital actually have ham radio in their business continuity plan or disaster recovery plan right they're they're going to have the uh, you know the commercial services in those plans for for the, the their DR situations uh, now some might um, I haven't heard of any yet but uh, Keith question That's excellent. So the comment was that there's some uh, CMS med medical uh, medical services that are starting to write in other sources uh, uh, like amateur radio into their uh, disaster recovery plan. You know, it's, it's it's there's an issue now because emergency services is becoming commercialized, professionalized. And if, if you don't have an MOU or, you know, under the ICS, uh, you know, incident command system, if you don't have an MOU or prearranged agreement, you can't bring someone in to help support the incident. And, and so uh, we, we need to get to the place where we are written into the agreements so that entities will bring in amateur radio. Otherwise, they can't. It's no, their plan says we can't do that. Uh, so, all, you know, that in time, I think with the ICS and with all these systems, working with, you know, from the amateur radio community, reaching out to get ourselves in those agreements uh, will get us involved. Otherwise, we can't. You, c you can't just show up under the ICS system. So. Uh, so, so the FCC is learning uh, that there is non-trivial use for Arden, and that uh, that means motivation to continue to share this space in, in 3 gig. Uh, I think that's a reasonable outcome uh, that that we can expect because it's very it's consistent with what's happening with with 5 gig, which which says we're not going to change anything with it. The only difference is, is already allocates Part 15 in some of these other uh, vehicle systems. Uh, three gigahertz going to shared use? Yeah, that's that's bad. We're it, it means we're gonna we don't share it really with anyone today. Uh, but it's uh, it, with that going back up to you know the commercial demand is is just so massive. We we should expect that we're gonna gonna share it. And that's what it means, a lot, lot more noise. Th uh, three gigahertz going to shared use? Well, uh, good amateur allocations have priority staying with, if we stay with secondary allocations, right? So, so it means that all the, with the NPR, in, in Notice for Pro's rulemaking, it's saying that uh, it will likely say that devices in 3 gig will still follow part 15, which means they have to accept interference from us. Um, it does say in the 5 gigahertz proposed rulemaking that it will follow part 15 rules and have to interfere, uh, accept interference from amateur radio. Uh, I, 
I think it was a combination. Um, we've we've all been concerned about it. I think for some. So so the question was was you know is was it just the ARL or was it just the community that has raised concern about this? And I think everyone has, and we've all been concerned about it for a number of years, knowing. Uh, there's been a number of, you know, even in 5 gig, it's already been allocated to other other uses that are of concern to us. They just never used it, and that this would it could happen. Uh, there are proposed rulemaking. You know, basically most of the microwave band going up through 6 and 7 gigahertz to to turn all the digital communications into uh, 802.11 protocols that are have proven to be very, very efficient with OFDM. You know, having a license out there for somebody that's doing a T1 microwave <laughs> it is, is horribly inefficient use of the bandwidth. <laughs> Just horrible, right? There should be no, none of that, you know, old licensing existing anymore. All of it converted to, you know, highly efficient protocols that benefits us and everyone. Uh, so, so let's look at you know, you know what what kind of hardware are we using and do we need to continue to to uh, deliver broadband services uh, in the ham radio channels. So, if we look at the ubiquity three gigahertz equipment that exists today, that device you you don't see an Athros 802.11 chipset that's a three gigahertz chipset. Uh, what you do see is chipsets that are 2 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz per the 802.11 specifications, right? There is no 802.11 specifications for 3 gigahertz. So, so how do you get a 3 gigahertz 802.11 device? Well, you, you take a 5 gig, 5 gig device, and if you look inside the 3 gig rocket from Ubiquity, there's a minus 2 gigahertz down converter. And then you get, you know, some coverage in in ham radio and we've this is the coverage we get out of all of our our allocations. So so we can either, you know, work with the internal converters that are that are out there to do this or we can add our own transducers to up convert or down convert to get to the right uh, frequencies that we're trying to get to. So if you look here, if, if let's say we did end up with a 3.1 to 3.3 uh, allocation, we could take a ubiquity 5 gig and we could get it at least down to 3.15 if we added our own down converter to it. We could do that. It now increases our cost to do that. It's, it's not as easy to just go buy it on Amazon, flash the firmware, and put it up on the roof. Uh, uh, now, now we'll have some, some more uh, project uh, kits to, to have fun with, and some, you know, we might like that too. <laughs> but it'll be a little, you know, another step in the process if we do our own down, uh, down converter on it. Uh, with with a three gig that's done internally, uh, well, let me let me come back to that. If we look at the five gig radios, so here's a typical coverage. Uh, this, this is a ubiquity device. They'll go from 5150 up to 5875 per the manufacturer specifications. Now now will they go above above that below it? Maybe it depends on how tight their hardware filters are. Um, it, it, it might actually go down to 5.1 uh, with, with, with minimal or negligible power loss of, of the signal. Uh, it might, you know, today we're running, you know, we're going up to uh, 5925, channel 184. We're doing that on a device, we're doing that 50 megahertz higher than what, the, what that manufacturer specification says it can do. Well, this is such a broad range of frequencies that the, the hardware filter 
uh, to get that broad range probably isn't so tight on the end. And that's why we're able to go up to 59.25 today. As we, we change the firmware, the chip will do it, no problem, but you know, does all the downstream hardware filtering allow that frequency is the issue. So, uh, uh, so, so we, are, you know, we are getting 50 megahertz above the manufacturer spec on, on rocket M5s or Ubiquiti and Microtech devices today. So, so here's a really interesting. Um, so this is this is a Rocket M3 Ubiquity device, and we've and we've pulled the RF shielding plate. This is a a, a broken uh, device that that failed, had a hardware failure somewhere. Pulled the plate off of it, and these are uh, these are all filters. And so we popped this filter on the end of it out. This was done by uh, Ken, KE2N. And he, uh, he popped it out, and you can see it up here, it's popped out there. And then he put his signal generator on it and just started you know, going up, stepped up in frequency and measuring the output power of it. And this is the profile that he came up with as to what this filter on the very end of this three gig device allows. So, so let, me, let me just explain this real quick for the non double E types here. Um, what this is saying is if I transmit a 3.4 gigahertz signal, the output power, so let's say from that point is that. If I transmit a 3.2 gigahertz signal, the output power is attenuated 20-some um, dB. Now let's put that into perspective. If I attenuated uh, 30 dB, I've attenuated it by a factor of 1,000, right? So if I, if I was putting out one one watt right here, and I went down 30 dB, you know, to here, that would be one milliwatt by a thousand. So so what does that mean? Well, if I'm if I'm putting out less than a watt to begin with. I, the signal that I'm putting out over here in this frequ re frequency range is going to be almost nothing, if, you know, a thousandth of the power, right? So, so Arden is supporting 3.37, about right here. So. If you use a, a 3 gig in Arden today, I recommend you stay on 3.4 and above because you're, you're going to get a little bit less power. But, but we couldn't support frequencies lower than that because it's just not putting enough, enough power to, to make a connection to anything. But, the, but the, the significance of this is is that these devices come with hardware filters that chop off the at the edge of their supported frequencies. And and we can only go so far out of them. So if let's say we got an allocation, you know, today we end at 3.5. Let's say they gave us an allocation between 3.6 and 3.8. That's trivial. Now I can use it in the uh, without doing any hardware modifications. I can just change the firmware and there's no hardware filtering that's, that's going to uh, going to block the signal and it'll it'll work. We might we might get into some SWR issues with, you know, d just as we're going pushing outside of the filter, we are likely also pushing outside of the SWR how well that antenna matches the transmitter and how effectively it will transmit the signal. Uh, so, so we could run into some losses with SWR as well that we'd have to look at. 
Right. Exactly. So, so we, yeah, we we would have to make changes to the hardware to go out of that. Free, you know, between about three three seven five and you know past three point eight, we would have to do hardware modifications to to have a device we can effectively use. Yeah. We haven't we haven't run in this plot on the five gigahertz, you know, because we're we're 50 megahertz higher than the specs, and it's working, right? It, it's there's probably some drop off of power at those higher channels uh, because it's going pushing outside of the filter range of what the device's specs are. So um, it it would be good if we could do a plot of the uh, the uh, devices we're using and their hardware filters, you know, and pull that that filter out at the, the very end. So, so the summary of this slide is, is for us to use this low cost equipment, we need them to be pretty close into their specifications of where they operate today. Keeping in mind they're covering the whole world allocations, not just the US typically. Right. When when you see a device and it says USA or international, that's not a hardware thing. That's a firmware thing. Right. They're they're going to build one piece of hardware that supports the world, and then they're going to lock it down to the region or location in firmware. So what else can we do? Well, if you look at the Part 15 specifications for Uni3 for tower operators, if they use, for example, one of the big, the big rocket dish 34 dB I gain, you know, this is their biggest rocket dish antennas, we only usually get 30 dB gains for most things. I don't know if anyone's actually gotten the 34. but with a rocket matched with that very high gain antenna, a unlicensed tower site operator can't use the full power of the rocket through that antenna because he'll exceed the licensing that he has. You, he'll have to dial down the, pa the, the transmitter power to stay within his licensing. And, and that might be something like, 15 or 17 dB instead of 25 dB, right? In, in other words, we can get above, just with the commercial equipment as it is, what the unlicensed uh, operators can do that have to stay within part 15. And, and if you look at that, I, I, I didn't do like antenna line loss and some other things that I've accounted for here. So. So the, the, the power is going to be some, somewhat a little bit less than that, but we're, you know, we're talking three inch antenna lines here, minimal loss. Um, effective uh, EIRP, radiated power. So that's a measure that says that the energy coming out of this dish would be as if I had uh, an isotropic radi you know, a ball of energy that was putting out 794 watts going out in every direction is what that says. Now, you know, that that's microwave kind of power. Don't don't stand in front of these things, <laughs> please. <laughs> but but the point is we can we can use uh without modifications, you can even find higher gain antennas probably than that and put these devices on them and put out a whole lot more power than what an unlicensed WISP operator could do. So you can get above their noise. More cost. Uh, also, we can add power amps. You know, the ATV guys for years have been putting out a lot more power uh, than what, what these devices do. Now, more cost, of course, but we can do it. 
uh, with OFDM, which is the 802.11n and AC specifications, Part 97 ham radio says we can do 1,500 watts peak to peak. That's transmitter power. That doesn't even include the antenna gain. We'll fry some birds, right? <laughs> but keeping in mind, there's also some Part 97 rules that say, you know, the minimum power you need to, you know, do communications as well. You don't, you know, nobody's going to be putting out 1,500 watts peak to peak in microwave. <laughs> you might not be able to afford the uh, the power amp, but uh, yeah. <laughs> But we can do it, right? We can go get some power amps and, and we can, we, you know, just uh, two or three watts of, of transmitter power uh, up above will we'll do the trick. Um, first presence, if, in, in many sites, if we've already established a presence at the site, then, it, then it's, you know, a beachhead, we've established it, then it's harder for a, in the future when there may be licensing for the WISP operator to come in and, and take it over if you've had it established for a number of years. So anyone that has access to or contemplating putting up uh, 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 Arden nodes in these bands should go do it to, to preserve it, uh, to establish a precedence with it. Now, specific, uh, particularly if, and this, is, I, this may not be well known, if you have a site in a national forest, you can register your transmitter and frequency with the national forest, and they'll prevent anyone else from from using it. You can go through them, and they're not the FCC. They're you know they're not they're not the tower owner that's you know you're working with, but they're um, you know they own that physical area if there's a tower site uh, within the within a national forest we've run into that at uh, elsinore peak uh, the owner there is has lease from the national forest we had a, a visit from the national forest once just coming through to check all of our licensing and everything and and they do that and and uh, you can lock in with them that you're the only one in that area that can use that frequency uh, so then the tower owners and the WISP operators can't do anything about it. You, you're not going through the site owner to use a frequency. You're going to another <laughs> bureaucracy of the, the, the national government to help you do that. So, so be sure if anyone you know has any towers anywhere in the national forest, that's where we can lock in things. Question? It's a different agency, <laughs> right? They, they, the National Forest can control what happens in their territory. <laughs> well, you have to, you, you, you know, the National Forest will have to register and approve that you can do that, right? They're, you know, they're going to have tower sites that they have zoned in the National Forest. so. So at Elsinore Peak above Temecula, that's in the National Forest. At Pleasant Peak where I'm at, which is surrounded by National Forest, it's private land. So it's not, it's, it's, uh, not managed by the National Forest. So, uh, so if you're in National Forest where you have rights from the National Forest and the tower sites uh, authorized, um, you know they're managing what you're doing there. Then, then you can now register your frequency with them. So at Elsinore we could register it. At Pleasant Peak we can't because it's private land surrounded by national forest. So, so little little things like that may not be well known, but but that you know if you can get into the three or five gigahertz register with the national forest, then you've got it locked in. At, at that site, regardless of what the owner of the tower site or WISP operator might say. Okay, I just had a filler slide here. We're running out of time, but just to remind everyone what an OFDM signal is, um, it's made up of all, you know, 64 carrier waves. If I looked at a carrier wave on this frequency, 
its frequency spectrum would have lobes over, you know, going out like that at the higher and lower frequencies. The O in OFDM is orthogonal. And what does that mean? It means it's uncorrelated or that it doesn't interfere with the next carrier wave. So see where the null point is between these primary and, you know, trailing off lobes? The, the null point is right at the center of the next carrier. That's what it means to be orthogonal uh, or, or uncorrelated signals. So, so that means, um, you know, every one of these is the spaced and the timing of the symbols uh, then, then allow these carrier waves so that they don't interfere with one another to be very, very close together. And then, then over time, I transmit the carrier wave and it's, you know, some phase or amplitude that's carrying a symbol and the symbol could be two bits or four bits or eight bits. And, and I transmit it for that symbol for that length of time. Then I have a little guard interval and I transmit another set of symbols and we've got 64 carrier waves. So in a 10 meg, you know, no matter if I'm on 10 megahertz, 20 megahertz, 5 megahertz, it's still 64 carrier waves. They're, you're squ they're squanched into that channel. And then the timing is I take, if I go from 20 to 10, the timing will double. It has to double to keep this orthogonality. To, ke to keep that signal OFDM, right? So, so while I may have 64 carrier waves that, that are now taking up half the, f the frequency space, they're now taking up twice the time. So things like, you know, power per symbol or, uh, uh, is still the same regardless of channel and, and timing. But, but that's, that's what OFDM is. Um, some of the some of the exam questions that got put out in the last round of exam changes thought that Arden and 80211 technology was spread spectrum, which has a limit in power. It can't go to 1500 watts peak to peak. And so there were some questions out there in the pool that that have said that. I'm not sure if they've corrected that yet, but. Um, only the old spec of 802.11g that nobody's using anymore had some modes of spread spectrum that would have those power limits. For, for us, 802.11n that we're only doing in, in Arden uh, and AC nowadays that everybody's moved to, it's OFDM. It's not, that's a, you know, it's like the difference, you know, AM modulation and FM are just two different techniques. Well, spread spectrum and OFDM are two different techniques, just the same. So, so all of the signals we're talking about, that's, that's what it looks like. That's what the O in OFDM means for orthogonality. Okay, we've run, we've run out of time. Uh, just had several slides here to, of, of photos and whatnot if you haven't seen them, but if, if anybody has any questions, we've got We've, we've run out of time uh, for, for the hour, but we have a birds of a feather in 30 minutes, and it's open dialogue, and we can have lots of discussions, whatever we want. Any quick ones? Um, I'm, I believe this is supposed to be recorded and will be posted YouTube or somewhere. Uh, check the conference schedules. I know they did last year, so I would expect it to be recorded and available online today as well. Uh, and I'll likely post it to the Arden website presentations or something. All right, qu last question. Yeah. Yeah. So new device support, yeah, um, let's talk about that in the birds of a feather and, and we'll, we can get some detail in that. And, and it's in 30 minutes at three o'clock. Yeah, yeah. so you know, take a break, grab a snack and we'll, we'll kick off with uh, some, some open discussions. Hmm.